Good evening, and welcome to The Other Side. I'm your host, Bob Serba. And I'm Paul Fournier. And we're going to be your guests this evening. Uh, Paul, I got to ask, what's with the Cubs? <laughs> well, you know how we had talked about the override and budgets and school budgets and you being on the school committee, myself being on the school committee, I figured what better way to show people exactly how to find money in the school district. <laughs> so really, here it is. That, that ball, the, the ball is the money, and this is what happens. They move it all around like this, right? And then you have to kind of guess and see. So where's the money? Where's the money? Is it in here? Nope. Maybe it's here. Nope. Oh, look, it, it's right there. But you know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow's another day, so we can do this all over again. Oh, Jesus. It's so true. You know, and that's, unfortunately, that's how the system works. And, you know, people think it's... Um, I don't know. People, people think it's, uh, it, it's, it's the people that are running the district. It's not really the people that are running the district, although there are some that are questionable. But a lot of it has to do with the system themselves, the system itself. And that's mm -hmm. the public school system throughout the country, not just, not just here in Spencer, but it's the public school system throughout the country. When you think about um, what it is that, that uh, we do in school and what our teachers do in school and what our administrators do in school, you think about how much it costs to run a school district, pay, benefits. I mean, that's a huge weight on taxpayers' shoulders. Well, a long time ago, the feds came in and said, listen, we're going to help you out. And then the state came in and said, we're going to help you out. Well, they were helping us out so much that they decided that would, they wanted to take some of their money back. So what did they do, Bob? They ended up cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. And the state, our state anyways, is not going to be happy until the, the, the majority of our funding, which is Chapter 70, gets to be an equal split. So that means about 51 percent of the, the, the money that comes into the district is going to be uh, supplied by the state, and the state wants us to come up with 49 percent. Well, something has to give. Either we have more taxes, high evaluation, get rid of town services, bigger school Class, bigger classrooms in the school. Um, the only way you can do that is to streamline the district, cut your expenses. How do you cut your expenses? You start with the big stuff, and what's the big stuff? Teachers. It's the same old, same old, day in and day out, year after year, not only in this town, but throughout the entire country. Well, formula doesn't change. I mean, it's, it's like you said, everybody's dealing with this problem. Everybody's dealing with this issue. We're not exclusive. Um, I've watched Boylston, I've seen Wachusett, um, uh, Ashburnham, Westminster, where Dr. Hicks is working, just went through an override. I mean, we're not, we're, it's, it's not exclusive to us. This isn't, um, it's an unfortunate situation. When Dr. Naaman came in, there was people that were hired, as you well know, you were on that committee, there was people that were hired that shouldn't have been hired. There was raises given that shouldn't have been given. Um, there was a, a lot of fiscal mismanagement. And a lot of people said at that time, well, how come somebody didn't go to jail? And I think, I think the DA, somebody had mentioned to me that the DA said, well, you can't send somebody to jail for financial stupidity. Correct. And that's the bottom line. So here we are. The crux of the situation is we've got a two and a half override in front of us. And, and as people are watching this, it's already going to be, it's going to be decided well, one way well, or the other well, by the time correct. this is. Correct. But that's not to say that this isn't an important issue. This two and a half override is going to keep coming up. It's because it's like you said, the state, the state's not going to keep funding this. They, they keep giving us less money. If you go to the April meeting, it's the, what I call it, the annual wringing of the hands with Stephen Brewer and, and now Peter Durant and Ann Goby. Every year it's the same thing. And I've sat through a number of these. And every year it's the same. They come up and they say, there's just no money in the coffers. And it's, it's just not there. All right, well, and, stop, and, stop right and there. And it's not. Hold on. Stop right there for a second. Let's think about what you just said. There's no money in the coffers, okay? Anytime in any town, city, state, nationwide, what is the very first thing that the, the government goes after? Two things, education and seniors. seniors. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, let's think. Let's see, education has to do with, well, I don't know, how many kids are in public education system? So they know that those, those parents are going to come up with coin to, to come up with the shortfall. And seniors, nobody wants anything to happen to the seniors. They've already given to their 
local towns, city, states, country. So we, we can't. So what are the two things that they go after that they know people will back up with, with extra money? It's those two things. And enough is enough. So enough of telling us that we don't have any money in the coffers. It's time to change the way we look at things and look at our education process and change that. Well, the problem with the state, and, and DeVal Patrick's is big a, is big a, um, a perpetrator of this, I think, as anybody else, is they're constantly saying, well, we care about the kids. And, and the ironic thing here is the Democratic Party has always been the party that has always been about education, about social services, about giving back to the community. Yet we have, we have a majority Democrats in, in, in a state house. And the bottom line is they don't want to give up any of that money. Now, what happened to, to, to the local aid? You got the lottery system. Every year we get less and less money from the lottery system. Why is that? I mean, my question to you would be, where are, where are our reps? Where's, where's, where's Mr. Durant? Where's Ms. Gobi? Where's Mr. Brewer? It's like during this whole process, and this is not to, to bang anybody. This, this, don't, don't get me wrong. This is not, not trying to take anybody down, but it's like we're in the middle of a fiscal crisis. Our two state reps live in this town, and I haven't seen them at one meeting. But I did see one of our reps at a meeting you know, endorsing the Spencer Rescue Squad override. So it's like, where are your priorities? You know, when it comes to education, that's really not that important. I really shouldn't get up and speak about that. But when it came to the Spencer Rescue Squad, well, I need to talk about that. And that, I got to tell you, that went over me wrong. And, and I'll be the first one to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of Mr. Durant. But that's got, that's neither here nor there. That, it's doing the job. It's about getting the job That's done. right. It, whether you're a fan or not, he's been elected to do something. Absolutely. And he should do that. Um, this is a, it's a tough situation. Um, and, and I'll get just real quick of... Uh, how I got involved in the school committee and, and really involved in the schools is my, a couple of years ago, my son came home from uh, school with a library book and it was, the binding was taped on the back. It was tape everywhere. And I thought that was kind of strange. And so I just started asking some questions about, you know, how come we don't have library books? How come we don't have, and I wasn't getting the answers that I thought I should get for the amount of, that we pay in taxes. So. Um, I started talking to teachers, and I was limited because I wasn't on a school committee, but just a few of the teachers. And luckily, my, my mother-in-law's best, one of my mother-in-law's best friends is, was a teacher at, at uh, Lake Street for years. And uh, so I got to sit down with her for about an hour one day, and that was it. That was, that was I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run for school committee. Now, did things turn out the way I wanted them to turn out? No. I, I, I was, I got snowballed by, by this guy like everybody else did. And um, I never realized how hard it was to try and make changes. I never realized how hard it was to follow the money. I never realized, did you know that the superintendent of a school district is the only CEO that can move money wherever he feels like moving yeah. with, without a vote of the school committee or the town or anything like that? I mean, literally, <coughs> pardon me, you could see $100,000 in... In a, on a line item one day, and the next day it would be someplace else or gone. It's unbelievable. And I'm not saying that every superintendent doesn't have the best interest of their school district um, in their mind, but I think there should be a little bit more government involved as far as limiting where that money goes. Once a line item is set, salaries is set, that's where it stays. Um, health insurance is set, that's where it stays. And that should be the same for the entire school district. I mean, it takes X amount of dollars to run Lake Street, it takes X amount of dollars to run the high school, but you know, all the way down the line. Once those, once those numbers are set, that's the way it should stay, but it's not. They can move it anywhere they want. So that's just one of the, one of the problems that we need, to, uh, we need to fix. We need to come up with some solution where we have a little more control of what the school committee can actually see and, and, and keep an eye on rather than just voting on the bottom line of a budget like we were told before. So, Well, part of the problem with being, and, and you know, being on a school committee as I was, it's, there's no mentoring process. You basically, you, you put into this job, you, get, you spend about two hours at, at a, basically at a briefing, and uh, they come out and they give you a briefing, and, and you, you talk, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, this is what an open meeting law violation looks like and a very, very brief overview. But other than that, that's it. There's no mentoring process. There's no somebody sitting you down and saying, here's the budget, here's how you read the line items. You basically, it's sink or swim. 
and, and everybody goes into it for the best reason. I mean, you're not doing it for the money because nobody's getting paid for this job. No, it costs money. You know, money. <laughs> you're doing it because it's, you know, you, you, uh, hopefully you're altruistic and you care about the kids. I mean, that's the reason I got into it, and that's why the reason I think everybody pretty right. much gets into it for the most part. The thing that, that really, I think that really tore me up during the whole process when this whole thing, when this whole thing started up in December was the absolute intensity of how quick people were to blame everybody. Now, I, granted, I was on I was on the superintendent search committee. I thought Dr. Naiman was was a, a great choice. He was a unanimous choice. There was absolutely no doubt. We had many educators on our, on our panel. We had uh, two I think two or three administrators. We had three school committee members. It was very well represented, and head and shoulders. Naaman came in the best. Now, having said that, looking back on it, we realized what a mistake that was. You know, my bad. You know, that's, wow. you know, and that's the way that goes. But I guess my point to this is because everybody, the way it was presented and at the meetings, when you went to any of these meetings, it was like a Roman circus. I mean, it, you, you were sitting up there. It was, I mean, there were actually people in the audience applauding because there was a deficit. And I remember getting up at the meeting and saying, you ought to be, you folks should be embarrassed. And it was, it was absolutely ludicrous, and everybody had this total misconception of, well, how come you didn't know where the money was? How come you didn't find it? How come you didn't know what Dr. Naiman was doing? And how come you didn't know this and you didn't know that? The misconception of what, of what the school committee actually does and what limited say they have over something, it's like you said. I mean, I sat, I sat on that committee and watched a budget change at five different times, and every single number changed, shifted all over the place. And I mean, that's that's... The right I of remember a, that. Of a I was, superintendent. That, that was the year before I got involved. I was 2010. I was, yeah, I was sitting in the audience, and it was like, uh, I had, that was the first time I'd ever been exposed to a, a school budget, a, a public school it budget was amazing. meeting. And it was, like you said, it was, I don't know how many, it could have been five, but every time I went there, there was something else. It was either something was going to get cut, or we needed an override, or we're going to have to do this. It was five consecutive times, or four consecutive times. It was... And every, I, I don't want to say it was funny, but it was it was kind of it was comical. It, it almost it almost, it was like a Buster Keaton movie. I mean, the thing that really that really irritated a bunch of us on the committee at the time was every time we would sit down, we would see that budget when we sat down. That was the first time we were actually putting eyes on that budget and we were actually looking at it. And I remember saying to, to the business manager and saying to the superintendent at that time, "Why is this?" And they're like, "Well, you, you can't see it ahead of time." So I called it. I called the. Uh, I called the uh, AG's office and I asked them and they laughed at me and they said, is this the first time you've been on a school committee? And I go, yeah, it is. And they go, no, you should be seeing that ahead of time. So hamstringing school committees is something that, that unfortunately, you know, that does happen. W whether you want to believe it or not, it does happen. And I think the misconception, again, is the fact that you guys are this overseeing and all seeing, you know, everything that's going on in the district. There are so many moving parts to a $26 million budget, you can't even hope to begin to do it. And people no. say, well, how come we don't have professionals? Well, you know, all you're going to get is people who volunteer, if you're lucky, will volunteer to serve on the school committee. And then when they get on the school committee, what you see and what in the public perception are two completely oh. different things. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and the lack of power that you really have being on the school committee is pretty funny. Everybody thinks that... You know, you should have done this, and you should. If if I had to do it all over again, would I do some things differently? Absolutely. My concern was when I first came in was the books, and seeing the tape on the books, and then the physical portions of our of our uh, school district because I have a plumbing and heating back construction background. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was concerned about um, you know uh, things getting cleaned, boilers getting cleaned. Uh, preventive maintenance. That you know, what are we spending on paper towel? That that side. That was my side of what I concentrated on. You know, so that was your expertise. That was my expertise. And that, but once you get in, and you, once you get into this, and you start getting into the nuts and bolts of how a school system works, it is one of the most convoluted things I've ever seen in my life. So, it's like Chinese math. It, it's unbelievable. It it really is. It's like a Chinese fire drill. It's like there are so many different things going on at one time, and you can't hope to keep up on them. And then you've got the whole thing with with personnel, and that that's a whole nother that's a whole nother section yes. of what you deal with. And I, I'm you know I'm sure people remember you know when I was in trouble with the unions for asking unions to take a pay freeze because mm -hmm. in 2010 we were being led to believe that there was a fiscal crisis there. We were told we were going to be we were short a great deal of money. Um, long story short. 
when this happened, this happened the, my first, I was there in, I got elected in, in May, and it was at the August meeting, the union got up and, and started berating the committee. I wasn't there, I was, I was home, I was hurt, I'm laying on my back, I blew my back out. And I watched it on TV, because one of the school committee members says, look, you just have to watch this, and I watched it on TV, and I'm watching the union berate the school committee for not getting the contract done, which in and of itself is illegal, because you're not supposed to talk about that outside of the Correct. collective bargaining agreement. Now, having said that, the first thing I did was I said, well, listen, we're, we're in a deficit. We have a problem here. We need, you know, we need to ask teachers to take a pay freeze. Well, that's the third rail of, of Spencer Reese Brookfield politics. You don't talk about taking pay freezes or doing anything else. And let's face it, this, this union for this town, for, this, for these school teachers, has done, has done a great job. There's no two ways about it. What's the union's job? The union's job in a school district is to represent their constituents. And right. they do an excellent job of that, as witnessed by their contract. It's, it's, it's an excellent contract. The problem is now, here we are three years later. 2010, we were, we were having problems. Now here we are three years later, we still, the problems have actually gotten worse. My question, and it's been the same question I asked at the, at the Spencer override meeting, as the same as the East Brookfield override meeting, where is the union input on what we're going to do to take this thing forward? We've got a two and a half override on the books. What are we going to do? I haven't heard a union member, if, if one of them has showed up, I haven't seen him at a meeting. Um, I, I'm kind of amazed because it's like, this is a collective, a collective thing, and I've heard Dr. Malvey get up and speak very eloquently about, we're going to have to get rid of music, we're going to have to get rid of sports, we're going to have to get rid of, of, of this for the kids and that for the kids, and it's all about what the kids are giving up. Then it's, you know, we need this override because it's going to cost us X amount of dollars depending on the assessed value of your home. And I understand that. I don't think anybody's against funding education. The question becomes, are we funding education or are we going to, you know, are we going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? And that's the that's the biggest problem I have now. Whether this override passes tomorrow or not, we still have the problem. Where do we go from here, Paul? Well, but I think it's it goes even deeper than that. Um, th this is not something that just creeped up over the last year. Oh, absolutely not. This is something that has been uh, stirring in the pot, stewing in the pot, I guess, for. I don't know how many years, um, and you can tell just by it, when you when you go into the school. Now I'm I'm a little bit closer to it because I have a son in the second grade and I have a son on the fourth grade. So last year in the first grade class, I was I was talking to the first grade teachers because my son was in the first grade, and they said, "Let me show you something." So they brought me in. Here's some workbooks. We copy out of these. They're 15 years old. Before that, I was out in East Brookfield elementary and I was talking to a science teacher um, and she said can I can I ask you a question I said sure she's like well do you think we need new books I said well I don't know this is you know uh, I would assume that you would you would buy new books every so many years because technology changes and things change she's like I had a she had a she had a, a science a student in her science class come up to her and say the periodic tables in our science book are not even up to eight, are not even up to date. There's two elements missing. That's not acceptable. So we get into this, you get into this budget crisis stuff, but you see where the lack of investment into the schools, books, technology and stuff, has really been limited, if not ex non-existent, close to non-existent. Pretty much. We've got computers that don't run certain software. We can't, teachers can't bring their laptops in because the software on their laptops does not, does, won't run in conjunction with the, with the wireless stuff. And it's unbelievable, you know. And, but we keep putting kids out that are doing okay. So, I mean, we had kids go to Brown and, and uh, Harvard. And, I mean, we've got, a, I think we've got a pretty good system here. I think the problem is, it's like anything. We just haven't reinvested back into exactly. the system. Because at the end of the day, there's no money. You know? There's no, and is, is an override going to change that? No, it's, it's, the the over, but the override has to change it. The override, the money has to go back into the system. It has to. It has to go back oh, into I agree. the kids. It has to go back for technology. It has to go back for books. 
You know, we've let this district go far too long. Uh, you can, we could be here for, or we could sit and talk about this all night. But the, the fact is, the, the the override is needed, and the override needs to pay for the re, to to reinvest back into the schools. That's what we need to do. And I Based agree, if that would happen, I'd I'd be 110 no. percent behind that instead of going in to pay for salaries and, and going to pay for to keep on paying so they, so you know so that the union can keep paying you know 20 now they're paying 25% but this is the first concession the unions made in years okay in years they made they finally made a concession they went from 15% health care input to 25% health care input and then they got a stipend to to defray that cost so and I understand over time that's going to that's going to bring us money as teachers retire and as teachers sure. step out of the Correct. system we're going to collect more money off of that but in the short term it's you know in the next 10 years we're not going to see a significant amount of money and the money we see from that you know what's the savings when i was when i was on the committee in, in 2010 and we talked and i said you know i'd like to see teachers take a pay freeze and they they got they got all bent out of shape they they weren't happy about that and it's like listen what's the bottom line here who's standing up for these kids you know, and, and somebody in the audience stood up and it was like a Jack LaLanne class. I stand up for the kids. And it was like, well, that was great. It was a real, a real hugging moment. You know, it's like you just wanted to hug somebody. But it's like at the end of the day, where are we moving forward helping these kids? We got computers that are 11 years old. Dave Bashan, I was talking to him. He ran the CVTE program. And they have kids that go out and work with other businesses. Businesses are giving these kids software and they bring it back to the school and they can't use it. Correct. When Matt Baldock was the IT director. Uh, what was it, three years ago, when Matt was the IT mm -hmm. director, mm -hmm. they had a main server, and they could, they could get educational software off of the server. Well, if too many people tried to get it at one time, like mm -hmm. four, it would crash. Right. And I mean, we've been talking about technology since 2010. When I was on the committee with John Rossi and a couple people from East Brookfield, we were talking about, what cap, it was a capital needs committee, where do we try to put our money? And one of the things we wanted to do was try to put it in a technology. But again, that just, it never seems to get there because at the end of the day, nobody's willing to make any concessions. In, in 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, teachers' salaries went up 3.4%. That was an average. Now, that didn't count the steps, which is another 5 to 9% increase up to year 17. Now, most people don't know is after year 17, they don't get another raise, I think for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think another five years after that. I think year 22, 17 to 22, they get a raise. They stop at 17, and then they finally get another one yeah, at 22. Right. But anyway, one of the things I brought up to Dr. Malvi at, at, the, uh, at the Spencer meeting was, you know, we were talking about, you know, teachers are going to, if this override passes, I believe that the union will grieve this. I believe that the union has in their contract right now, they think the steps and the pay, pay raises are frozen for 2014, but that doesn't mean that they won't turn around and grieve it and when a union grieves something, it's always behind closed doors. You never know about it. It's not written up in the TNG. And there, there was, I think, at the last meeting, there was, there was uh, a list of grievances. I saw the agenda online, and there was grievances then. You don't know what they're for, right. but you know it, it's usually involving some sort of money. And that's the kind of thing that kind of, that kind of makes me angry because it's like, and it's not that the union's not doing what they're supposed to do. Don't get me wrong. The union's doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Problem is, we're not holding the line and saying to them, look, What's more important here? And, and I'm not talking just the school committee. I'm talking about the FinCom. I'm talking about the selectmen. I'm talking about the taxpayers at large. I'm talking about the parents. We're a level three school district. When I said that in East Brookfield at the, over, at the override meeting, the Monday night before our, our meeting in Spencer, Dr. Melby said, well, when the DESE comes in, they automatically classify you a level three. No, we were already a level three. We had three schools already underperforming in our district. Now, my question to the taxpayers and everybody else is, and, and I know you want more than that for your kids. Sure. You want to be the best district possible, but how can we be the best district possible when the union doesn't even have a teacher evaluation with any teeth that the, Mass the state of Massachusetts even recognizes? We don't have that. Dr. Malby says we do have an evaluation, but it's not recognized by the state of Massachusetts. Now, if we don't get something done pretty soon, we're going to lose the race to the top race money, which is money we get from the state Correct. for participating in this program. So it's like, what are we negotiating here? Why can't we come to a common ground and just say, look, it, we need to get this I, done for the kids? You know what? I think, um, I think it's just the way that 
things have gone for so many years. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, not just here, but through the whole public school system throughout the oh, country. Oh, we're not exclusive, no. Go back to years. It's a constant us versus them mentality. Us versus them. Us versus them. You know? And you could go back and, and look at, um, well, let's I play devil's advocate here. Say, let's say you needed a, something done to your heart. Would you prefer to have somebody that just came out of school work on it? Or would you prefer to somebody that had <laughs> 10 or 20 years experience working on your heart? You already know the answer there. You know, okay. So when I, you know, when I have, when my kids are in the school system, I want to make sure that we have the best teachers possible teaching my kids. And it's like owning a business. I own my own business. Do you hire the guys that ride in on their bikes that maybe may and may not show up? Or do you? Go and look for the, the, the employee that comes in, he's got a car, comes in dressed nice, has his own hand tools, respects what you own as an employer, or would you prefer the, the guy that rides in on the bike, and, or it could be the girl that rides in the bike, I'm, you know, I'm not prejudiced one way or the other, but, um, you know, that, hey, geez, you know, I, geez, I forgot my pliers at home, or, you know, holes in this shirt, and maybe ripped jeans, and that type of thing. But I, I, I think that's, that's what we need to go to. I think we need to have that, you know, the, 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 the teacher evaluations are an important part of this process because that would get rid of the us versus them mentality. You know, it would be accountability would be part of the, the pay, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I want the best people teaching my kids. And how, do, okay. we know, how do we know that's happening and if we I, don't have, that, I, situ if we don't have don't that in place? And I'm, I'm, okay, with, I'm okay with teachers making... Sixty thousand or sixty-five thousand or whatever it's it what is they went to school for. It's what they, whatever that. it is that they. But what I don't want, and I don't think anybody wants, no matter if it's a school system or your own private business or anything, is the skate-alongs. You know, the the ones that just kind of. And I and I'm not berating anybody in this school district. I I, I don't know all the teachers in the school district. I, I the only ones I I know are the ones that I've had direct contact with, and that had to do with my kids, you know, um, but, you know, the, the pay for the teachers to me is not the problem. The, the, what the problem is, is being able to you being able to have enough stuff and the proper stuff to educate our kids and not 10 and 11 year old computers, not workbooks that are 5, 10 and 15 years old. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine working with a, how about it, it, myself? What if I had to work with a plumbing code that was 15 years old? You now, couldn't do it. Well, I, I mean, you could, but you'd go back to, you'd be doing things that were uh, maybe obsolete that you don't need to do. But no, you, you, we need to work with stuff that is, and we need to offer these kids the stuff that is now. That's 2013, not 2003, or not 2093. Oh, I agree. 2013. I agree 100%. You know? I think part of the problem is it's, it, and this isn't just our school system, this is every school system, it's last one in, first one out. You know, and when you're talking about, you know, some of the older teachers, and this is no knock on older teachers, I'm just saying, when you get young teachers in, you're bringing in new blood, you're bringing in vitality, you're bringing in people with new ideas, you know, and that's important too. And unfortunately what happens every time we get, you know, we get this kind of thing where we have this layoff, they're all gone. They're the first ones to go, and that's sad. And the other part of that, the other part of that is that, that really drives me crazy is I hear, I see, I talk to teachers from other dr districts. I've talked to, um, I've worked for a couple of administrators. I do a lot of work in Boston. And I've I was working for a superintendent in the, in, from the Boston area late, recently. And he's telling me how his teachers have taken, you know, they've taken pay freezes and they've, they've come forward and said, look, we don't want to lose any, we don't want to lose any jobs. Now, our town, is, our town hall is a, a fine example of that. And our town police force. Our police force went from 17% to 40%. In one year, on their health health care, on their health care right, input, right. you know, and that, and the same thing with the town. And why did the town employees do this? The town employees did that because they they feel like they're a family and they don't want to see somebody lose their job. In 13 years, I have never ever heard one time this district ever say, "Listen, we'll step up and we'll do we'll do we'll do the right thing." You know, we don't want to lose anybody, and nobody wants to take a pay freeze. 
You know, but let's let's be realistic, Paul. We both own our own businesses. I'm not making the money I was making 10 years ago. And I'm not saying let's take this out on the teachers. I'm just saying no. that's just the way it is. People right now are very fortunate to have jobs. I think that's where we get into the system. I think the system is broken. Oh, absolutely. You know, I There's think no question. It's, you've got to revamp the system somehow, some way, shape, or form so that it is um, not resting on the shoulders of the taxpayers, yet whatever the taxpayers are paying, they're making sure they're getting the, their bang for the buck. This is, you get into excise tax, and I know we're going to, this is kind of going off on a tangent No, because tangent excise, a tax, excise tax is it's supposed to be what helps fund education. To, well, it's also part of our road restructuring stuff. It's also part of what's supposed to help pay for our roads. How's that working out? And it doesn't, it doesn't work <laughs> out. So it's just twenty million dollars worth of road repair and Spencer you know, alone. And I it's, mean, it's it, like it, it just—it's a never-ending. It's like the dog chasing its tail. It's like the the cups and the and the money. You know, you can it, there it is. You can put them anywhere you want. You can shift them at once. You know. It is what it is. And then, it, you know, if you lift up this one, nope, it's not there today. And if you lift up, oh, there it is today, but it may not be there today, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's unfortunate because that's not, I don't think that's the way our founding fathers really set this country up. I mean, we're setting ourselves up to fail is what it is. Oh, absolutely. You know? But, the, you know, and, and the bottom line is, and, and this is the bottom line, until we get health care costs under control, until we get some help or some support from the union. Like I said, no one from the union has stepped up during this entire process, other than to criticize. And I remember, I remember Mr. James, who's the head of the, head of the, the teachers' union for, for, for Proud East Brookfield, getting up there and saying, we need to share the pain. Well, we are sharing the pain. We're sharing quite a bit of that pain. You know, and that, this is when they were talking about laying off, I think, right. 28 teachers right, at the right. time. That's not sharing the pain because tenured teachers aren't going anywhere. It's, it's like I said, it's the last in, first out. And it's like I just get tired of that same old litany of, well, you know, you don't care about the kids. Well, yeah, we do care about the kids. And I think a lot of people in this town right now, especially with this two and a half override, are a little bit put out by the fact that there's been nothing. There's been nothing put forward saying nobody. And I've been to a bunch of meetings and nobody has said, listen, this is what we need to do. If we get this override. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to move this district forward. We're going to restructure this. We're going to put money over here in the textbooks. We're going to put money into technology. That conversation is not happening. And I'm watching the FinComs. Now, I can't speak for East Brookfield because I don't know. But I know our FinCom were against it at the meeting, at the town meeting. And they're like, we can't support this at this time. And, and that's fine. That's, you know, that's, right. that's what they do. They crunch the numbers. They go through all this. Right. But what has happened since then to give them this awareness and this, this come to Jesus moment where they go, oh, the money's, I get it now, I get it. I, I'm not seeing it. And they're not sharing that information with anybody. It's just, oh, okay, rubber stamp, we're good to go. Let's do the override. Until somebody can show me where this money's going to go and how this money's going to be spent, and until I hear from the union saying, not the teachers, the union, because the union speaks for the teachers. Until I hear the union saying to me, listen, this is what we're willing to do instead of that old complaint, oh, well, we gave in something 15 years ago and we got burned and we're not going to do that again. You know what? That was played out three years ago and it's played out now. And I remember when in 2010, when we were asking, when we were going to get Matt McCarthy came to us, he was our insurance guy on the board. Yeah. Because that's, that's Matt's business. That's what he does. And he said, look, we've got, we got this anomaly, and we're going to actually get money back. We're going to save some money on health care, which is, as you and I both well know, it's not going to happen very often. Right. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was a chunk of change. I think it was like 300000 or something like that. The first thing the union said was, we want half of that. Seriously? It's like, you know, and that's the way it is in, in almost everything that goes on with the union. It's like, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. It's like, that belongs to us. That's not how it's supposed to work. And if it wasn't for that mentality, Paul, I probably wouldn't have the feeling that I have about the union that I do. But I never see any concessions being made. I, I hear a lot. I hear the kids being put up like hostages. You know, it's the kids. It's about the kids, you know, and so let's put them up like little shields. But nobody ever comes through. Look at, look at the, 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 our former administrator told us he was going to cut sports. He was going to cut, he was going to cut the band. He, and and we, this is the first we heard of it was at that meeting. 
And we're looking at each other going, did you guys know about this? And everybody's going, I didn't know about this. And, and, and this gets unloaded well, on us. Again, this, this goes back to that us versus them mentality. This goes back to... But who creates that? I, I, I don't know who's created it, okay? Uh, the, the creation has been, the creation's already made. The problem is you need to chip away at it and get rid of it. You know, you don't eat an elephant. No, you, you, know, you don't eat an elephant all in one bite. Nope. Okay, you, you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> so, you know, but until that goes away, we're going to keep running into the same problem time and, and time again. But it's time a big elephant, Paul. It is a big elephant. <laughs> it is a big elephant. You know, so just real quick, you know, this is, the lack of books and technology, we both agree that. We both agree that that's a, a massive uh, missing link, missing portion of our school district. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. Um, chapter seventy money decreases every year. Not it's not our fault. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not the taxpayers' fault. It's come from the the, the state and the feds. It's in an outdated. It's an outdated. It's, system. it's an outdated system. So. And in, in, in there, and in the, the state, being who they are, has decided that they wanted, instead of giving us 80% funding, they're going to give us 51% funding. And for those of you that don't understand, every single year the state gives us less and less. Sometimes it's the same, but it's never more. Very rarely is it more, but it's usually less than the previous year of this Chapter 70 funding money, which is a big portion of where our money comes from for our school budget. So who has to kick up? That extra amount would be the taxpayers, the towns. That's why that's why the state is so keen on on uh, regionalizing everybody. Oh, absolutely. That, you know, th to see us in, in East Brookfield together, they they would, geez, get a couple other towns together with you so you can share the share that cost burden. So until people understand that, that's where that's this is a this is a bigger this is a big elephant, <laughs> you mm. know, and there is a lot of bites to it, but. You get the books and the technology. You got the Chapter 70 money decreasing, so that means that's on the taxpayers. You got health insurance increasing. That's on the taxpayers. Um, until the system is broken down and revamped, every single uh, town, city, state throughout this country is going to run into the same exact thing over and over and over again. It will never go away. Every school year is going to be the same. It has to get redone. You have to break it and fix it. But having said that, and that makes sense, but having said that, how, what can we expect in this current school system? What can we do as taxpayers? What can we do as, as individuals? How do we change this? How do we, how do we move this thing forward? It's got to be, it's gotta be <clears throat> a consensus of ideas, Paul. I mean, w without a doubt. It's going to take the union getting involved, the teachers actively getting involved, to, you know, parents. I mean, the parents of Spencer East Brookfield, uh, the Concerned Parents of Spencer East Brookfield is a great group that's, that's got started. And it's like any time any parent gets involved and, and volunteers to, to come forward and do something about the kids, I, I, I could do nothing but applaud that. I think that's, I think that's phenomenal. Um, it, it's it's going to take but more of an effort. It's going to take more of a grassroots effort. But I think we need to make it clear to the people within this school system that we're not going to accept less than, less than the best anymore. And, and that doesn't mean we have to pour a lot of money into it. It just means we have to actually start caring about the system. We actually have to stop playing that the kid card. Well, we care about the kids. It's like, not really. You know, if you really cared about the kids, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. We got kids that, that don't even have books in this school. We haven't bought a book. I looked at the 2014 budget. There's not 10 cents in there. for. There's money in there for workbooks but not for actual books. I, I, I don't well, that, even think I could tell last that, time a but book that was, that goes was back, made. That goes back to the whole system again, okay? Um, th there's never been anything in this district for future or foresight, nothing. Uh, normally what, what you would see is you would see a rotation of books. So there would be something in the budget for first grade and then second grade or maybe just or, or math across or the board or science it. across the board or every four years you knew you were going to get new books but it would be in the budget but it's, it was a, nothing in this district is run like that nothing look at the schools okay before maple street was closed you had to go to five schools yeah to, it was to, a little for ridiculous. kids to graduate out of it that's ridiculous in a in a in a town of twelve thousand people are you kidding me well, what was funny was when you said that to me that when you first ran for school committee and you said to me, do you realize our kids go to school to five different schools? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? They do. 
And what's funny, and you, you brought this up to me originally when you got on the school building committee and you said, and all the time the schools were being built when, when, you know, not so much East Brookfield, but when Wire Village and Knox Trail were being built, nobody had the foresight to say, hey, we can close Lake Street and Maple Street. Maple Street was an old school even to then. Lake with. Street, uh, we can close two schools, do a pre-K through, through six or whatever, and then, you know, run seven and eight up at, up at you know, that, nev that never occurred to anybody. So here we are in a situation now where we're talking about, and this is, God knows this is down the road, but the Prouty Project is still a possibility. I mean, you know, the bill depends on, on a lot of factors. It, it has absolutely. to get done. You can't You continue. can't put it off forever. Okay, no. everything's been put together with, with glue and duct tape in this district for such a long time, and it's, now it's time to pay the piper. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be mean. No, it's and the same I, and, with everything. You know, but it's been put off for such a long period of time. You look at Maple Street and, and Lake Street, as a, as prime examples, that Maple Street was a that was a disaster. That place was a dump, a dump. The teachers hated it there. The kids hated it there. You know, lines of kids lining up to go to the bathroom. It was just not. There was no bathroom on the same floor as the, where the kids were. Was it just was not. Like, you know, we used it because that's the way it's always been. And you know, thank God the boiler broke because we'd probably still be there. <laughs> you know, I brought it up a year and a half ago I to close that, that place. I remember. I was called a crackpot. Yep. Really? And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, this, I got an oh, idea. this is a Let's great close idea. Maple Let's Street. close Maple Street. <laughs> <laughs> so. Sometimes anyway. you just can't. Yeah, I it's mean, like, it's, like, I, it's, like, I, it's like the road system. I mean, pardon me, we spoke about this in a meeting. I said, I said to Adam, because he brought this up again about the roads. They did a whole thing with the roads. And I sat at a meeting, oh, God, back in 2008, I think that started. And it was $11 million then. Well, because we've done nothing. Now it's $20 million. So it's like you said, it's, it's not like maintenance, de deferred maintenance gets any cheaper down the road. The problem is, when do you ever have the money to fix it? You know, people were on fixed I, income. I, you got, it, you know. It's a circle. And I get it's it. It's a vicious circle. I get it. But it's, that's what I say. It's going to take more than just putting money into a system and expecting, you know, that's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over Correct. and over and expecting a different result. Correct. And that's exactly what we're doing, I think, with these overrides. And it's not, it's not that they don't need the money. The school, this school could spend $4 million tomorrow. We could upgrade technology. We could do all kinds of things. We could buy books. We could put smart boards in the classrooms, you know. But the bottom line is, without a consensus from everybody working together and trying to get this thing done, or, or even, even moving forward a plan to get this thing done, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with an override. Just tell me what you're going to do to make this at least head in that direction to work, you know? Nobody's expecting any miracles. Dr. Melby's not gonna be here probably from, I would not imagine more than maybe 12 to 24 months, tops, okay? I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but what do we do with the, what's the next superintendent we get? You know, what, how do we move that, this forward? I think, it all, do do? I think it all goes, again, it all goes back to the us versus them mentality, and, and I think if you can get enough parents involved and break down that, chip away at that wall, you know, chip away at that wall, I think as it, as it, a, a cognitive group, a, a collective group, I should say, I think if, instead of going in all different directions, I, I think I used this analogy when I first ran for the school committee, as a matter of fact. Um, you remember the, the, the Roman ships? Was it the Roman ships or the Viking ships? Where they used to have like 100 guys down below and everybody had an oar, you know, and then they you had some guy beating a drum, boom, boom, and they would all go in the, all row at the same time. That's not what the school district is. We got... Uh, you could, 100 people down there, and everybody's going in, it's like Mo, Larry, and Curly. Oh, there's no question. It's like Mo, Larry, and Curly of the, of the school. District. Everybody's rowing in a different direction. Everybody's got their own agenda. I'm going to row this way. So what's happened is the boat just keeps going around in circles like this, <laughs> you know? So anyways, uh, we could sit here for another hour and, and talk about this, but after tomorrow, we'll, we'll have a little more information about which way we're going to go and... Um, we're going to, I think, uh, change the pace a little bit now because if I'm not mistaken, uh, 12 years ago we had, well, before we get into that, I have a couple of September facts that I just want to share with our viewers. <laughs> so, um, and these are just crazy things that, that I've come up with and other people have come up with. So just so uh, everybody knows, uh, September is National Chicken Month. It's also, it's also National Rice Month. It's also National Potato Month, so you can make soup, and you can cover all of those things all at the same time. 
National American Breakfast Month. Did you know that? Do you know what the birthstone for September is? Sapphire. When was your wife born? <laughs> October. Oh, well, I don't know what that is. October what? October 12th. Oh, did you know that? Huh. She's a Virgo. <laughs> uh, no, Libra. <laughs> but anyways, there's some, there's some kind of cool stuff that comes with this. Um, it, it, but it's just it's amazing when you go back and look at all the stuff that's transpired over this time, uh, the time in history or just in September itself. How many things actually went towards creating the United States and who we are? But like you know, um, you know, 12 years ago was a little bit different because I think we were all uh, woken up by um, the vulnerability of being able to be targeted in our own country with the with the, the hijacking of the planes and crashing into the the towers and uh, that was probably one of the one of the hardest times I've, I've ever had to deal with just about anything. I mean, I've never seen, I've, I've never seen a whole country stop um, and, and not, the whole country stopped. I remember listening to WAF, which was just hardcore rock, and th for two or three straight days, they did nothing but talk about. Yeah, I remember that. I do know. remember that. Um, so I, I think we need to put things in perspective and, we have our own problems here in Spencer, but you know, for the, for the most part, I think we have it pretty good. And um, this is a great country, and I think if we just continue to get rid of that us versus them mentality, and obviously get rid of the Democrats and the Republicans, <laughs> never going to happen. I know that's 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 never going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you keep talking. We say keep saying us versus them. It's like you know, we're all in this together. You know, we got, everybody's got a vested interest. It's like, you know, I, I no longer have kids in the system. My kids, I have, I have one, my oldest has graduated, my youngest is, is going to graduate next year. And they both went to Prouty. Um, you know, we were, we were very active as parents in the school system, and it's like, I think that's, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people making an absolutely concerted effort. You know, do you want this to be a good district? Well, it's, it's no longer... And I, I guess it goes back to the, those, those meetings in December when everybody was just absolutely vilifying the school committee. And it's like, look, it's not just about the school committee. You can't just expect somebody to stand no. by and monitor all this. And all of a sudden you say, well, listen, I've been living here for 20 years and, and, and now this is important to me because there's a problem. Well, where were you before the problem? Not that, not that that negates the fact that you shouldn't be there. You should be there absolutely voicing your opposition or, or whatever you think it is. But I think people... You know, a lot of times go off half cocked and they get half the information. Mm -hmm. Or they hear something at the grocery store and they say, oh, well, I was talking to so-and-so when they said this and they said that. Um, that letter this, you got, the, that letter got you got this, in your mailbox today is a, is a prime mailbox. example. I don't, I don't know if, if you guys can see this or not, but this, was, this showed up in my mailbox. Can you guys see that? Can I get a little closer? Probably not. But uh, somebody... Yeah. Uh, this isn't signed by anybody. I don't know who produced it. I found it in my, I found it in my mailbox uh, today, but really it's nothing more than propaganda because a majority of the stuff isn't even correct. Well, we were looking at it. We <laughs> so were looking at the front. It was like I'm really taking making chat marks. I'm like, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> well, it just, it just goes to show. It's it, it makes the point of. You know, if you've got information and it's good, then, then put that information right. out there. And then you flip over the other side of that, and the information is pretty accurate. So I think it's, it's off the DESE yeah. off website. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, you get some of the information right, you get some of the information wrong. It's like if you have a question, you call a school committee member. Pick up the phone. You know, I mean, I, I've done it with Steve Brewer's office. I've done it with, with Ann's office. And Ann's not even in my district. If I had a question, I didn't hesitate. I don't hesitate. Well, I to think call her. I think even Dr. Malvey was pretty open. I think when he first came in, he said, "Just I got an open door policy." Yeah, he was. I've Knock talked to him. Door. He was great. I had Knock a question for him, and he sent he sent some information yeah. right over to me. I had no I mean, problem. It's like obviously he's a busy guy, and I'm sure you know if you send an email at seven o'clock, don't expect one back hmm. at seven o one. But um, you know, I'm sure that uh, given a proper amount of time, he'll get an answer for you pretty quick. And you that's know? half the battle in this town is, is people tend to, to take, take, you know, what they heard. You know, oh, I was talking to somebody and they said this. It's like, well, if you have a question, call your school committee member. Call your selectman. You know, you, all their emails, you can go right on the town site. Go right on the town site. All their emails are on there. You can, most of these guys are in the phone book. You can contact them. Right. Half of the stuff that, that, that I hear about is information. I just kind of go, seriously? 
you know, or I'll call somebody. I'll say, you know, after writing the blog for five years, I, I, I know a lot of people. And I'll go to people and say, listen, I, you know, I'll talk to Adam God. That's a prime example of somebody to go to if you have an issue or you have a problem. Call Adam, email him. He's responsive. I've never called Adam's office that he hasn't called me back. And I'm sure there's times he's going, oh, God, it's Bob again. You know, on many occasions, you I know, do that. It's like, but you know, it's like he's always been responsive. I mean, you can go, you can get information almost anywhere in this town, but you have to actually pick up the phone or take the time to go over and talk to somebody and ask somebody. Or if you think something's going on in a school district, you could talk to Bobby O'Brien or Dave Bashan or Joyce Nelson or, or Ron up at East Brookfield. Or, you know, any, the, any of the administrators will talk to you, you know. It, I think half the problems in this town stem from the fact that people just don't have the right information or don't bother to go and get the information. Oh, I heard this. Well, did you call and, and ask anybody? Well, no. no. It's not that hard. I mean, it's, this isn't brain surgery. Hey, listen, it's, it's no different than, I don't know if you've ever practiced, uh, if you ever did this back when I was in school. I, I remember my teacher leaning over to the f kid up in the first row. And whispering something the into whisper the, game. W w the whisper game, whispering <laughs> something into that kid's ear. And uh, by the time it got back to the last kid, you had to repeat what it was, and it was like it was completely totally different. So, bizarre. Yeah, I understand that. And that's just, that's just the way thing is, that things are. People sometimes are just, they, I don't want to say lazy, they just kind of believe what it is that is said instead of investigating it for themselves a little bit and asking a couple of questions, unfortunately. Well, if you know? it's important. You know, if it's just some, some gossip, it's like, you know, so-and-so is doing this or yeah. doing that. It's like, who cares? But it's like if it's something it. to do with your school system or you hear, I, and I don't know how many times I heard stuff like that. It's like, well, I heard that this is going on. I heard that's going It's like, pick up the phone. Right. You know, it's, it, it can alleviate a lot of problems. Right. Um, just as a, as a word of an announcement here, we, got a, we have a sixth annual food drive in SCA Open House Saturday, September 21st. At 11 to 3 p.m. in a DPHS parking lot. Help local families by stopping by with your donation of non-perishable food items or a financial contribution to the Spencer Food Pantry. Enjoy a free concert, tours of the new SCA high-definition television studio, Aaron, that's for you, and hot food from the grill. Enter the raffle for a free chance to win great prizes. Special guests will be producer Chris Emery, oh, performer Chris Emery, I'm sorry, local favorites Chuck and Mud, class with Bemis Farms Nursery, Entertainment begins at 1 p.m. No charge. Please bring food or a monetary donation. And you can find that on Facebook.com slash SCA Food Drive. And that's courtesy of Spencer Cable Access and Feeding Our Neighbors. So when is that? That is September 21st, 2013, 11 to 3. Is that a Saturday? Saturday. Uh, I believe it's a Saturday. It'd be right out in the parking lot. Well, um... Any more interesting facts there? I do have some more, but you keep laughing at me. So. Good. Do you know, in, in, in 1846, Elias Howe patented the sewing machine. Um, in 1847, the United States forces took control of Mexico City. In 1783, the Revolutionary War in America ended after Great Britain signed the Treaty of Paris. Can you imagine that? Absolutely 1939, World War II began in Europe because the German troops invaded Poland. I gotta find you some books. Do you know the birth, the birth flower for September is the morning glory? <laughs> I love useless facts. You're well, in some bad of it's shape. some of it's not useless, but I'm all, I'm good with the National Chicken Month. Most I had no idea. Useless. Um, so we're gonna be doing this again next month. Yes. So uh, uh, this will be showing up on Thursday, I believe, a week from Thursday. Okay. Um, I'm not sure the date so, on that. So we'll know about the override by then. Uh, we'll know about the override by then, and um, hopefully we'll have a guest that night. If not, we'll spend some more time on the budget and what direction that they, things are going to go in. And uh, well, I'm sure we'll have November useless facts as well. <laughs> oh, I just, I'm just trying to bide my time here. I'm just kind of worrying about that now. Um, I know we want to do a couple things. I know we, we look at, we're interested in looking uh, at one of the, and some of the shows looking ahead. I want, we want to talk about the Spencer Rescue Squad. Yes. Um, the impact that's had on the community and, and how that's going. Um, we also want to start doing a restaurant spotlight. We'd like to spot right yes. different restaurants and different businesses, but we'd want to start with the restaurants because there's a lot of good things going on with the restaurants right now. I think the other thing we had talked about is uh, we're going to be looking at town services. Yes, and, yes. And the, the, the charter communication, charter cable access, or whatever it is that they have. How come we can't get Fios? How come we can't get... 
don't know if we're locked into a, a certain contract. Or, yeah, that I, anyways, I don't we'll know. Up, I don't know. We want to look at all that, all that stuff, and hopefully, like I said, we'll have something. Uh, we'll have something with the school budget that uh, we can work with a little bit. It'd probably be a good idea at some point to get Dr. Malvi on, uh, maybe once things calm down and get a get yeah, his love perspective. Yeah, to get him in here. Get his perspective on on. Uh, we also want to go through town services. We want to talk to. Uh, we we're talking about talking to Steve from uh, the water department from the the, from the, uh, from the DPW. Oh, that's right. Yep. Uh, Steve Tyler from the DPW. Uh, Frank White also expressed an interest. He's a water commissioner mm -hmm. in town. He's expressed an interest in coming out and explaining about water rates. And well, I know that's a that's a hot topic because I, I don't have town water. I have well water, but I know uh, listening to the seniors at the. You know, I, I know. Uh, cheap. I know the the uh, the water rates have skyrocketed over the last few years. So three hundred percent. I don't know. I'm not privy to that information. I like I said, I have my own well, so I don't use the town water. But yeah, I would like to know. I'm sure. You know, other people in the town. Would well, like there's to know. so many things going on. I know, like with Steve, uh, with the with, like with this whole thing with the roads. I mean, Adam brought this up at a meeting recently, and it's it's you know now we're talking. To, I mentioned this before. We're talking a twenty million dollar price tag. How do we pay for this? You know, and that's it's something that Adam talked about, and, and and he said, you know, look, we've been putting this off and kicking this. There's another can we've been kicking down the road, and we can no longer afford to put this off. I mean, anybody who's been down Paxton Road or 31 or, or any of the other roads in town, they're, they're atrocious at best. I mean, these roads are in really bad shape. Yeah. And the longer it goes, I mean, and, and you're talking, there's different plans to bring them up to like to, to you know to medium grade or to the, to bring them up to the full, make everything perfect again. It's we're looking at twenty million dollars, and you know I've, I've talked to people like, well, what, how are we going to come up with twenty million dollars? And it's like, well, it's like everything else, you know. You do. It's, it's that bite of the elephant, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, it's like sooner or later you got to do it, or it's going to cost you. I mean, just since two thousand eight, like I said, it's gone up nine million dollars. That's not getting any cheaper, you know. Right, right now you're looking back at that and saying, yeah, you know. I agree. Five years ago, that five years ago that was a real bargain now we're talking twenty million dollars and it's like on top of this and on top of on top of the school budget override and everything else it's like everything in this town has been defrayed is, is just defrayed delayed for so long you know look how long it took to get town hall done i mean that was like and and that's that's a, and then here's a question for you why do we only have one light in front of the town hall and why does it look like hell you know, we got that one wooden light out there. It's like, why don't we just take that away until we can put a couple of granite blocks and put a nice light or something on there? And I've mentioned that to Adam before. You know, it's we got a beautiful town hall and you got this one one light and it's all faded out and it looks it looks horrible. It's like, how about we make the rest of it look nice? You know? Yeah. Well, I know it took a long time just to even get done what has been done there. And know? they actually save money. That's good. They actually, they it actually came in under budget. So you know, it was one of those situations where, and now look at it, thing is gorgeous. But it's like if we don't start investing back into that, just like investing back into the schools and like everything else that's going on in this town, we can no longer defer maintenance any longer. We can't just keep pushing this thing down the road and saying, we got to hold off, we got to hold off, we got to hold it's off. It's not going to work. No, it's it's not working. It's not working, and it hasn't worked for some time. So it's like you know, at some point we have to belly up to the bar and say, look, this has got to get done. We got to figure out a way to do this. It's it's not going to happen overnight, but we got to start at least looking at some of these things, and and God knows the school is is probably the biggest priority. Because let's face it, if our if our evaluations go down on our homes because our school district is not a you know a level one district, everybody loses. So it's like everybody loses when seniors say you know, and and I get this. I mean you know. You know, we're on a fixed income in this and that, but you can't do anything. You can't do reverse mortgages with your home. You can't do anything if the ho if your house valuations fall, and they're going to fall if you're in an underperforming school district, bottom line. It's one of the first things parents look at. First thing, my wife was a realtor for years, and the first thing I ask is, what's a school district like? And what do you want to be able to say about, about Prouty, you know, or, or, or Wire Village or Knox Trail or East Brookfield? Right. You know, you want to say, look, we're, we're, we're a level one school district. And I don't think that's I don't think that's on that's that's not a sustainable goal, you know. It, but it's going to take some pride. It's going to take some pride. It's going to take some work. And like I said, it's going to take people getting together and right. saying, "Let's move this thing forward." We don't want to be next to last. We want to be the best. We want to we want to be the best that's in there, you know. And that's the bottom line. So I'll leave you on that note, folks. Um, other than that, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, we'll be back on Thursday again. And just keep watching for the schedule and watch when we're on.
Thanks a lot, and we'll see you later. Have a great night.